back in our Father's Word. Luke chapter 3, this is the chapter that gives Mary's genealogy. Not Joseph's, not somebody else's, but Mary's, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Naturally, this gives you the key of David. It gives you the key, uh, uh, actually, that takes you to the true genealogy of our Lord and Savior. Naturally, we know who the Father was. The Father was Almighty God. But then it's important who the mother was. And we noticed in verse 23, as was supposed, which is a legal term in the Greek, means by law. Uh, Joseph was the son-in-law of Heli, and Heli would be Mary's father. And we know from the fact that Elizabeth was a cousin, that Mary's mother was a Levite. That forever seals the, the fact that he was of the order of Melchizedek, the priesthood forever, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. But uh, so there you have it. Many would say, well, it says right there, Heli was Joseph's father, my father-in-law. You won't see any begats in this list of names. Why? Because it's by law, in law, not begats, as, as uh, Joseph's family is listed in uh, Matthew chapter 1. But in Matthew chapter 1, Joseph's father is very clearly Jacob not Heli, Heli, father-in-law. So I'm not going to read the names of, of uh, all those. Uh, one big difference you will find is in verse 31, and it's important, and you need to make a note of it for the true genealogy. And uh, chapter 3, verse 31, let's pick up with that a word of wisdom from our Father. And verse 31 reads in um, the third chapter, which was the son of Melei, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Mattatha, which was the son of Nathan, not Solomon. This is where the two genealogies differ of Joseph and Mary. Christ came through Nathan, okay, which was the son of David. In other words, it was his brother. David was the father, of course, but through Nathan, not Solomon. And then when the other difference in this is that Joseph's genealogy only went back to Abraham. Mary's genealogy, as is of a truth, goes all the way back to the beginning. Skip on to verse 38, if you would. Verse 38, to complete Mary's genealogy, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So here you have Christ, which is the only begotten of God, with the genealogy taken all the way back to Adam, which was the one created by God through which Christ would come through. That's important. You won't find Cain in that genealogy or anything pertaining to Cain, because Cain was not of that genealogy. As I read to you in the last lecture, you can find Cain's genealogy, uh, his key, uh, in St. John chapter 8, verse 44. So there you have it. That, um, and, and that is such important information in that chapter that you have Mary's genealogy whereby you can figure the key of David with accuracy and, uh, and be content with the fact that all the way back to Adam himself, whom God created, we have the only begotten, and uh, certainly um, he was the one who shows us how to do it, how to overcome. And one of the first things he will do, we'll find in chapter 4, let's get right into it. Chapter 4, verse 1, showing us how to withstand Satan. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan. He moved away from Jordan after the baptism and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was led by who? By Almighty God Himself, this being God with us. He wanted to prove this point, and the Holy Spirit agreeing to it. it spirit guided, in other words. Uh, verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days, all of them, he did eat nothing. 
and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. In other words, he was in a weakened condition, so to speak. You try to, you go without food 40 days, and you shouldn't, but, but because he was, he was the father's son right with us, um, it would be real easy to be tempted. But he's going to show you that he's not tempted. Neither should you be. This takes discipline. And you must understand the discipline that he shows forth in this place. Forty days, forty is probation in the Hebrew uh, num uh, num in numerology. Probation being tried. And so it was that he was, and he did not give in to that temptation. What did he do then? Verse 3, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, Command this stone that it be made bread. Uh, and naturally being a stone, Tyrus being one of Satan's names. For, and Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, <clears throat> but by every word of God. It's important that you absorb that. You live by the word of God, not by bread. So don't be tempted by bread, and don't be tempted otherwise. What, what, is, what is Christ quoting here? He's quoting Scripture, but you must know also Satan's quoting Scripture. Satan knows his Scripture pretty well, and that's why he can deceive a lot of Christians. I'm, I'm going to take you to the 8th chapter, verse 3, in the great book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. You're not going to have it. I'll read it to you. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which um, thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And, and so it is. That's, and, and Christ knew that. Why? He was the living word. But Satan's trying to tempt him into thinking and turning against God simply to serve Satan. Now, now Satan's going to try this on you. Evil spirits, they are in the world, just as the Holy Spirit is in the world. For every negative, there is a positive. But you can withstand. Why? Well, in the first place, when we get to the 10th chapter, Christ is going to give you power over all your enemies, including evil spirits, if you know how to use it, <clears throat> and if you have the, the faith and the knowledge to know how. But here, Satan tempting him in, in such a way. Let's go return to the fourth chapter of, and the next verse, verse 5. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I mean, uh, he was the prince of, Satan was the prince of this world. God gives him as the power of the prince of darkness. He kind of has his way down here if you listen to him. But you're not supposed to listen to him. That's why you listen to every word of God, whereby you have power over him, whereby you ha have the success not to be taken in by him. Verse 6, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. And it's true. God allowed him to do that. God allowed him to traverse this earth in a spirit, not physical, not de facto, uh, which means uh, he's still locked in heaven. Christ will tell him soon, get behind me. And so he is to this day. But his evil spirit can uh, traverse this earth, travel it, walk to and fro, tempt anyone he chooses that will listen. You don't want to listen. You don't want to give him that. Uh, and, and it is important, though, that you know, what is it that Satan uses to tempt Christ? Scripture. The very holy word itself. It was his to give. Listen to Christ's answer, verse 7. 
if thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. It'll be yours. I'll turn it over to you. It's mine to give to you. Verse 8, And Jesus answering and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. And that's um, De Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Christ throws that scripture right back at him. And um, Satan's not going to give up in verse 9, and he brought him to Jerusalem, Satan did. <clears throat> he set him on a pinnacle of the temple, very temple itself, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, here Satan's quoting scripture. Satan knows it's written. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, verse 11, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. That is, uh, that is scripture with the exception of one thing. Satan has tweaked it and turned it about 90 degrees to make it untrue. And if you don't know your father's word, Satan can, he can have you. He, he can... He can tempt you. Well, wh where is he quoting from here? He's, he's quoting from um, the uh, uh, Psalms 91. We're going to go there. Psalms 91. And, and within it, we have the very quote that he's coming up with here. Psalms 91. And we'll pick it up, if we may, with... Um, with verse 11, and listen carefully. See if you can pick where Satan changed the scripture. Verse 11, 90, Psalms 91. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, speaking of Christ, to keep thee in all thy ways. Did you catch it? You see, Satan said at any time, he put on a sideshow. God does not put on sideshows. If something bad happens as you're in the way, as you're doing your best and slip, yeah, they'll catch you. But just at any time, you go ahead and put on a sideshow and say, Lord, uh, cross this stream for me, or some, some dumb thing. It won't happen. Why? Because God doesn't put on sideshows. And, and uh, you cannot tempt God. And that's what Satan twisted this by saying, in all thy ways, changing it to at any time. That made it false. Verse 12 to continue. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Do you know why Satan wanted to stop short here and didn't want to finish the, the account? Listen to it and see if you can catch that. Verse 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adler. The snake won't give you any trouble. The young lion and the dragon, that's Satan himself, shalt thou trample under feet. And so it is. That's why Satan uh, was trying to tempt him because this, this prophecy goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where Christ said concerning the serpent's seed. Yes, it is God, the serpent's seed. It's biblical. God had said, uh, because you have done this, I will put enmity between the woman's seed, which is Christ, and your seed. He shall, you shall bruise his heel. You're going to nail him to the cross, but he is going to bust your head. He's going to destroy you. And, and so it is. Um, but there you have it. Satan always trying Satan always uh, utilizing Scripture itself. Satan works in pulpits more than he does any other place. He, he would rather work from a pulpit than he would down at the local bar. Okay. But uh, I know that may shock some people, but it's true. He's a, a Scripture lawyer. He likes to tweak it and, uh, and shoves in. And this is why the Lord God would say in the New Testament, the traditions of men, which is tweaked by Satan, make the true word of God void. So 
That's why you want to always pay attention to what God's Word, it said out of God's mouth, listen to that Word, not somebody else's. That's why you always document everything from the very Word of God whereby you are informed, certainly. So let's return then, if we may, chapter 4, the great book of Luke, and verse 12. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 16. Don't ever forget it. Don't tempt God. Don't try to put on any sideshows proving your faith or God's uh, loyalty to those that he loves. In the way, when you're in a Christian way, God will look over you. He has, the angels will look over thee. And, but don't try to tempt him. It won't work that way. And then he continues, verse 13, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season until another time. Verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, the circuit, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. The fact that he brought about healings, and his power and what he could accomplish. Why? He was the Son of God walking among us, the only begotten. Verse 15, And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. I mean, he didn't teach, uh, he didn't hide it. It's right in there, uh, heading their churches, right downtown with the true gospel. Verse 16, and he came to Nazareth, that's Branch Town. This is his hometown, where he grew up. Um, and he was that branch, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read, 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. This is very important, so you want to pay close attention here. He's quoting the Old Testament, and when he does that, there's a message there you need to really draw from. Okay, Verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me, Christ means the anointed one, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And this is what he was accomplishing. But listen carefully, 19th verse, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, period. Now, we just have one big problem here. He's quoting a scripture, and there is no period where he stopped reading. But he stopped reading for a very important reason. I want you to understand it, so listen carefully. Verse 20, and he closed the book. He gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. 21, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. It has come to pass. This day. Now, what you have to know is, where did, why did he stop reading there? This is what is known as the gap theory, okay? The gap between the first advent and the second advent. And where you find that is in Isaiah chapter 61, and Isaiah chapter 61, we're going to go there, and you're going to have it. We're going to read the first three verses. I want you to catch it for yourself, okay? I want you to learn for yourself. Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, that was his word, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings in, 
unto the meek, that's the humble, poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, that is to say blind, and let open their eyes whereby they can see, to, here it comes, listen carefully, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. He stopped reading there. Why? Why did he stop reading there? Well, listen to the rest of the sentence. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. In other words, that doesn't happen until the second advent. That particular day, the Lord's vengeance was not fulfilled. Only to that point of salvation, of the healing, of the casting out of evil spirits, and of preaching what? The word of God to all that would hear. Those that don't hear, I, that's all right. If you, if you don't want to listen to God's word, that's your problem. Okay. Verse 3, to continue what will happen to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. When it seems like that governments are going sour and everything is falling down around you, it's going to be corrected. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, lighten up, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. And then it continues on to the, into the restoration, uh, even into the millennium period. We're coming up on that time. But the point is, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, if you know why Christ answered as he did when tempted by Scripture in the wilderness by none other than Satan himself, and then we come to this place whereby he gives us the acceptable times and seasons whereby you're not deceived, then that makes it ever so beautiful. Why? You listen to the word of God. For as it is written, that's how it'll come to pass. Exactly. That's why it's so very important that you pay attention to what is written. For it is your father that has stated it and he will not vary from that course. Therefore, what you want to learn is what that course is so that you can stay on it as well. And in doing so, you receive his blessings in your life. It's so wonderful to have the blessings of God through the very word itself, whereby he can um, uh, remove all that heaviness, temptation, the temptation basically will be there, but you're tough. You can cut it. Okay? Why? Well, you're a child of God, can-do type person. Returning to chapter 4 of the great book of Luke, verse 22, and it reads, And all bear witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? He grew up right down here, the carpenter's son. How did he gain all this knowledge? How, how, how could this possibly be? I, I, I've seen him. I know him. I know he grew up right here. 23. And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. We've heard of, of um, in that city of compassion, and that's what Capernaum is, we, we've heard of the wonderful works that you accomplished there. Do them here. Let's see it. Let's see something. <clears throat> Verse 24, And he said, Very, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. You, you might learn from this. 25, But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, that's Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, three and a half years, when great famine was throughout all the land. And naturally, you won't always remember Amos chapter 8, verse 11, the famine of the end times is not for bread, 
but for hearing the Word of God. Verse 26, But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarapta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Now, um, you kind of want to remember here, here uh, why, why would it say this? Well, that widow, as it happened, had a son, and they had so very little. And Elijah said, well, bring it anyway, and it lasted for that period of time because God's divine intervention made it so. But listen carefully. I want you to understand why they're going to be upset here in a moment. 27, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, Elisha, which is to say the servant of Elijah, Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. They weren't even Israelites. They were healing other people, Gentiles. They weren't even of the family. This is going to upset them. You got it? But you, you remember, remember old uh, Naaman, man, man, Naaman? Uh, Elisha told him, you go down there and you dip in the water seven times. He said, I'm not going to do it. That'll make a fool out of myself. He said, you get down there. And his, his advisor said, do it. And on the seventh time, came out his, his skin from leprosy was as clean as a newborn babe. You see? But he wasn't an Israelite. Shows you the message of Christ is whomsoever will. The point is, do you believe the word of God? And, and the healing, the comforting, and the comforter is for all. That does not alleviate any duties or destinies for the people of, of um, God's elect. But it shows the beauty and the love of Almighty God to be able to heal and bring in whomsoever he chooses. Verse 28 to continue. Well, how are they going to receive this? 28, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. I mean, what's he talking about? Do that to a common person. <clears throat> Verse 29, and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill. That's the very brink of the cliff where on the city was built that they might cast him down headlong. They wanted to kill him. Verse 30, but he passing through the midst of them went his way. In other words, his, uh, super, the divine intervention of Almighty God in their wrath and anger, he was much smarter than they were. And God had his way with them. But this goes to show uh, many times when you're trying to teach where you grew up, no, you're probably not going to be received there all that well. It, that's just, it, it's a sad state of affairs, but that's just the way it is. It's not always that way, but most often is that way. I mean, they even did it to Christ. That's what he wants you to know. After even all the miracles that were performed, and then when he speaks of the fact that miracles are performed even for Gentiles or anyone else, if you believe. But this was Joseph's boy grew up right down next door. Then they choose not to believe. And then pretty soon they were turning their wrath because this happened in the synagogue. Uh, they um, were very upset and they, quite frankly, they wanted to kill him. A real Christian thing to do, huh? a real godly thing to do. <clears throat> so uh, that's the way it goes. That is human nature. And you must always take into account human nature and, and uh, derive common sense from it. And you will be far better off. Okay, let's continue with the next verse, 31. And he came down to Capernaum, that city of compassion, the city of Galilee, the circuit, and he taught them on the Sabbath days. And he, again, he wasn't hiding. He, he, right before everyone, 32, 
and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. No maybes, no ifs, no according to this good man and according to that man, straight on truth from God's word. That's what that's authority. Verse 33, and in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, listen to the devil, now 34, saying, let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? They knew who he was. Art thou come to destroy us? They knew he had that power. I know thee whom thou art, the Holy One of God. They'd seen him and they knew him. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. And they knew he had power to overcome them at any time he so choose, chose. Wasn't quite time for him to be identified as that yet. So he's going to shush them because it is not time. But the important thing for you to know, there's not an evil spirit behind every bush, but there are evil spirits in the world. And your spiritual discernment allows you to ascertain of a certainty to know wickedness when it comes in your presence. That's a gift from God. And you always want to be aware of that and be able to use the very power that God gives you as, as his blessing. And Christ would say to them, 35, and Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him uh, in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not, didn't harm him at all. Okay. So there was the power from on high of Almighty God over that that is evil. And you're worried about something? You don't have to be worried about anything. You're a child of the living God. He gives you power over all your enemies. When we come to the 10th chapter, we'll shore that up to where you won't have a doubt. But how precious it is that our Father used this one, this sent one, this Savior, to bring forth these wonderful truths, whereby he was the walking, living word. That's why he could quote those scriptures. But caution, 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 Satan quotes them too. Do you? Do you quote the scripture? I, I know none of us know the entire word, but you got to know enough to know when you're being had. And boy, Satan will do it if he gets the opportunity. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Going to go with uh, Mary from New York. Uh, what is the difference of the bottomless pit and the lake of fire? Did the devil, was, will the devil be put in the bottomless pit only once? And when the devil was put in the lake of fire, is he blotted out and no more remembered? Uh, you got it right. The, the bottomless pit is simply a prison of holding for the thousand year period. You can read it in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, that even a band, and that band in the Greek is, it, it not only bans his very presence, but this time it even bans his evil spirit. During the millennium, Satan's evil spirit cannot go to and fro on the earth. That's why that band is so very important that you understand that Greek word. He's helped there. And it is true, at the end of the thousand years, he is released for a short season. And God, the consuming fire, creates the lake of fire, and it blots out all that is evil. Laverne from Arkansas, I am confused on how to tell whether house of Israel and children of Israel is referring to the 12 tribes or 10 tribes. Is there a rule of thumb? Yeah, it's, it's according, usually the book is addressed like the book of Ezekiel is written to the house of Israel, basically. However, it does at the same time bring into account the house of Judah. And in Ezekiel chapter 37, at just, before, just at the beginning of the millennium, Ezekiel is told to take a stick and write on it uh, the house of Israel and the other Judah and join them together in one stick. That's when they go back together. Until then, they are split. It makes it very difficult to understand God's word if you don't know which house he's talking to. Okay? 
because those nations are in the world today, those tribes. And, and it lets you know the people and their destiny by understanding. Now, what I try to teach you, though, is when the name Jacob comes along, that is usually the natural seed, meaning all 12. That's the family, not the very different houses. But there are still two houses even to this day, and they will be until they're joined back together in one house. Joanne from Missouri. I would like to know what happens to a person who passes on with anger in their heart for their own child. I didn't have a lot of schooling, so it's kind of hard for me to understand. Please help me to understand why a father could ever hate or be angry at someone on their deathbed. Well, you must understand that usually uh, why does a person pass on? Many times it's because of a very toxic imbalance, because of the illness or from some other reason, the, the illness and what, what these um, toxins do is they affect the mind. So you cannot hold somebody when they are in the transition of passing or, or, or under the influence of heavy medication Please do not be offended by what they say because it's not really they saying it. You have to pull yourself above that. I mean, you always um, forgive and please uh, forgive him because he was uh, no doubt in the, when we know someone's passing, there's something wrong. They're ill and they're not necessarily in their right mind. This is unfortunately sometimes when people, I know many parents write me, and I do not talk about this subject a great deal because of mental illness in the world today, and that's suicide. But uh, many times when someone does this, it's a toxic imbalance that brings it to pass. It is not really the mind of the person, and God does not hold responsible if it is um, a toxic imbalance. Our We have we have taken this old earth, and I mean turned up gases and acids and poisons until these flesh bodies, if you don't pretty well take care of them, uh, many things can happen. So I'll let that pass at that point. Never judge people. Let God do the judging, and uh, please forgive him for what might have been said under medication and or toxins. Bo, Bo from Arkansas, where can I find the scripture that relate to the deadly wound in Ezekiel? Well, first of all, the deadly wound is spoken of in, um, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. That's when it actually happens. But in Ezekiel, when you find out it happens, the deadly wound comes just prior to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is when the one world system explodes and we go to war, and that's the deadly wound. <clears throat> Caroline from Colorado. I don't have a close relationship with my parents, even though I have tried to for many years. Is it okay with God to move on? Thank you for your ministry. You're, you are so welcome. Um, you know, it is not possible to get along with all people, but do love your parents for the fact that, uh, Carolyn, we've got you because of those two. And you're precious to God and to us. And, and you can, you can, we can be proud of your parents for the fact that they brought you into the world. Uh, sometimes, uh, again, uh, imbalances, mental and, or otherwise, can cause many things to happen. God's elect, when I was a child, I spake as a child, but as I grew and had maturity, you kind of rise above that sort of thing. Don't judge, but, um, but do move on. You're, you're wise in doing so, but at the same time, Always keep that, keep an opening if uh, things should change. Brad from Illinois. When praying, should we forgive everyone who trespasses against us? Um, no. 
if someone means Ill, evil to you, you do not forgive them. If someone keeps coming at you, you fix it. That's discipline. Um, you cannot, um, in other words, you, it is wonderful. After you straighten it out, then you can forgive. But if you're doing God's work, and something begins to interfere with that, um, in other words, in your family, in your daily job, in just being a good person, don't, don't let someone trespass on you. That, that, that's wimpish. You, don't, you won't allow it, okay? Um, at the same time, make sure you don't overreact, but, and always leave it in part in God's hands because God will fix it. But uh, no, I don't, um, if somebody continues trespassing, you don't forgive them. That, that's, that's wimpish. I, I know you've got a lot of bleeding heart Christians that will say, oh yes, you've got to forgive them and just let them tromp on you. No, Christians are not second class citizens. We do not let people tromp on us. We bite back if it's necessary. You love an enemy but it's the same as you love a child. You love a child, but if he, he's going to hurt himself, you correct him. You chastise him. Well, if you love an enemy, you do the same time. You chastise them. And if they're harming your people, you may have to go to large extremes, even by sending an army to get their attention, <clears throat> give them an attitude adjustment. And um, <clears throat> that's uh, tough love. But uh, that gets it done, okay? Uh, I, I know that, that that's not what you would expect a so-called pastor to say, but don't let people run over you. They won't respect you for that, okay? They will respect you if you stand up and, t and take care of business. Okay, uh, Rhonda from West Virginia. We are in the... Okay, um, I, I uh, have heard you speak on the subject of no rapture in 15 years. I admire your wisdom. Well, thank you. Uh, the, it's the word that it brings forth our wisdom. My question is, I know that God is not happy with divorce. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into your personal, but divorce is not the unpardonable sin. And if if the other party is the one that really causes it and brings it to pass, it's, it's, you're not guilty anyway. And uh, when uh, Jesus died on the cross to bring forgiveness when we repent, so for any part that you may have had in causing it, if none, repent, Christ forgives, and you have a clean slate. I won't go as far as saying it was as though you were never married because there could be children or something. But in the accountability that says it is, because why? Because Christ forgave you for anything. Divorce is painful, hurtful, and is a terrible thing. But it's not the unpardonable sin. And um, a, a person is free to remarry on God's forgiveness. I know that upsets even a lot of so-called Christians, it shows their lack of scholarly uh, biblical knowledge, but be that as it may. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Uh, Drusilla, no, Danielle, Danielle, I'm gonna say from great, from Idaho, I believe it would be. I was wondering if you could tell me what the number three stands for biblically. Do you have a CD or a book about the numbers? Yeah, you know, we have uh, biblical numerics that you can find it in the book list. But uh, three stands for completeness utterly, but it also stands for the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A wonderful number. Larry from Kentucky. Uh, I have a question for you. Do you think when people die, they go straight to heaven or hell? I always went to an old so-called church. I won't mention the name of it. I always thought when people died, there's nothing till Jesus goes back and judges from the Lamb's book. No, let's go by what the Bible says. That's the, what does the Word of God say? Christ taught this in Luke chapter 16. We'll be getting there in a few days. 
instantly on death, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your soul and your spirit body returns to paradise. That's where you came from. That's where you're going back to. But now as Christ so adequately describes and Luke with consist, uh, in a very concise way makes it clear, even using a medical term, there is a laceration right in the middle where you can't cross over. Some people make it and some don't but they're all there in spiritual bodies to await the millennium and following that, the great white throne judgment. No one is out here in a hole in the ground. Um, uh, the, this body flesh goes back to dirt from which it came. The spirit body goes back to father from which it came. Sherry from Virginia. Where did the, uh, let's see here. First I would like to, Okay, thank you for your comment. My sister is studying with you all for about five months now. I thank God for that little spark to get her mind working to understand. Thank you. My question is, here we go. Is God, if God made man in his image, when did the female come in? Were that female, were there female angels, messengers, and if so, why didn't God use them? more if any. Well, he, you know something? All souls came from God. We were all with him. And many people say, well, how, how did he decide who would be what, uh, male or female? And I always like to think, I think he probably, uh, females kind of, they have it a little tougher than we males do. I'll tell you that for sure coming out the gate. And God knowing that, I think he probably put the tougher souls in the female body, but it was necessary in a natural way to replenish the earth <clears throat> and for a soul to be born innocent, he had to have the woman to do that job. <clears throat> and those that were chosen for that are blessed indeed. Harold from Florida, when and where will this happen? First Thessalonians 4.17 shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Paul spoke colloquial Greek. Together in a cloud means a big cloud of witnesses, okay? And the word air as it is used in that verse means we at the seventh trump, that's when it happens. Where it happens is wherever you are at that moment when the seventh trump sounds, we are all changed into breath of life bodies, meaning pneuma, which is the word in the Greek is air, okay? It's a spirit body. It's far better than the one we're in now. And uh, it happens at the seventh trump. And it happens to everyone. The good, the bad, the ugly. Why? For judgment. Uh, Janet from South Carolina. Should a church exclude you from attending if you were not baptized in that church, even though you have already been baptized elsewhere? You know, I, I don't like to say what is right or wrong in another church. I, I can only say what I would do. I, I would not go there, okay? Um, baptism, any Christian can baptize another Christian. Christ will accept that. I kind of feel like if some church won't, well, then I don't want to go there because Christ probably wouldn't either. Okay. Now, I, I know that churches have traditions and I know that um, maybe they mean well by sticking to that. They, they think they're the only ones that have truth. Okay, don't tell them, but they think they're the only ones that have it, all right? And sometimes it shakes them if you would say otherwise. I wouldn't go there, okay? If somebody doesn't want me then and being a Christian, then I sure wouldn't want to go where there was a bunch of people that didn't want a good, solid Christian there. Carolyn from Kentucky. When you die, does your spirit stay in the ground until Jesus comes or does our spirit go on to heaven and is it working up there to keep, get ready for us all? They, they are, you know, this is why, this is, this is why people should read that one question just before 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he asked about 17. You got to back all the way up to the 13th verse to get the subject, okay? 
to know what it's really talking about. Well, what does it say there? Don't want you to be ignorant as the heathen. I want you to know if you believe Christ rose from the dead, then you better believe also that all that are asleep in him, that have died in him, have risen also and are with him. There is no way we that remain can, can proceed the dead, for they are first. Why? They're already gone. They're out of here. You can't proceed someone to heaven that's already there. That's all it's saying. And uh, so naturally, that answers your question. You're not out here in the hole in the ground. You're, you're with the Father.